So today, we hear our Lord saying in the Gospel, He says that everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Wow. So who's the most humble person that ever lived outside of our Lord? He's a divine person. He's God. Can't get any more humble. Our Lady. So who's the most exalted person that ever lived? Our Lady. Because she's the most humble that ever was, that ever will be. As a matter of fact, you know how she says of herself, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. In the ancient translations, the word that she actually uses is doulas, which in Greek means slave. She's literally saying, behold, I am the slave of God. Now today, you know, people would probably be like, ooh, rough terminology. But the language she's saying is, behold, I am I'm nothing. I'm like a slave. You can't get any more humble than being a slave. You don't have anything. And yet, and yet, as our Lord says, he who hum humbles himself will be exalted. It's because of that extreme humility of Our Lady that she's so exalted. And you think about it, of all the people that could have gone walking around saying things about themselves, she could have done this. And she would have been right. She could have walked around after the Annunciation event. She could have walked around and, and, and said, you know, I have the second person of the Blessed Trinity in my body. <laughs> so, you may kiss my hand. <laughs> right? She could have said pretty much anything. And she would have been right. Yes, she did. God took up residency in her body. Okay? Literally. For nine months. And she was the spouse of the Spirit. She, in a certain sense, just like a, a woman takes the, the name of her husband, Mary, in a certain sense, takes the name of God in the sense of uh, she doesn't become God, she's not God. But that intimate union between her and the Holy Spirit is so intimate that they're like so joined together that as we say those beautiful prayers sometimes, come Holy Spirit, come by means of the most powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, your well-beloved spouse. There's such a union between Our Lady and the Holy Spirit that great saints will say crazy things like, you know, Mary is the quasi-incarnation of the Holy Spirit. What? No, she's not the Holy Spirit. We know that. That would be heresy. She's not God. That also would be heresy. But the union between her and the Trinity is so intense, is so intimate, is so united. We don't have hardly anything to even compare it or get an, an, an analogy to understand it. She seeks to do God's holy will in every moment, at every instant, in everything that she does, every thought, deed, everything. So united is she. So humble is she. And thus she's so exalted. So exalted. There will never, ever be another creature who will ever outdo her in humility. It's impossible. She is the very pattern and blueprint and the model of what it means to be pleasing to God. That's why, and I'll be saying this uh, at 11 in my talk about Our Lady, that's why no one, no one ever becomes a saint without having patterned their lives off of the Blessed Virgin Mary because she's the pattern of creaturely holiness. It is impossible to be canonized which means to become sanctified, honored on the altars, to have your name, you know, so exalted that people actually pray to you because in the community of saints, it's impossible to, to, to have that happen without conforming your life to the pattern of what it means basically to be a Christian, the Virgin Mary, the most pleasing to Christ, the most intimate with God, the lover of the Blessed Trinity. That's why every founder of a religious community, doesn't matter who they are, whether it's the founder of the sisters here community, both groups of sisters here, the founder of my community, the founder of any religious community, whether he's a Benedictine, Dominican, Franciscan, Carmelite, Salesian, whatever, every single one of them had a devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Every single one of them. Because they knew the very pattern of their 
desire to follow Christ was patterned off of the, the greatest one who followed him, Our Lady. That's why every angel, every man, woman, and child should bow down and honor her. Even the Pope. See, even the Pope in his greatness, vicar of Christ on earth, speaks on behalf of Christ. Even the Pope acknowledges that she is greater than he. That's amazing. That's amazing. Who is this woman? Who is this lowly handmaid of the Lord, this slave of God, as she says of herself? Who is she? This is what makes those great saints like St. Saint Maximian Colby say, Who are you? O oh, Immaculate Conception, how exalted you are. What a mystery, a creature, and yet what a creature. So dignified, queen of heaven and earth. That is, if you heard my testimony last night, when she comes on the scene, evil vanishes. Satan is gone. Why? Because she, it's her delicate, feminine, tender little foot that crushes his head. It's been written. God has entrusted basically everything to her. God chose to come into the world and to save it through her. God chooses constantly to come back into this world through apparitions and all kinds of things through her. He patterns his church that he founded to be the ark of salvation off of her. We can't have the church if we don't have Mary. Mary's mother of the church. The church is, as it were, Mary's daughter. Amazing stuff. You know, the Catholic Catechism says that there's no salvation outside of the Catholic Church. Did you know that? Now, you have to understand it rightly. That doesn't mean that Protestants aren't going to be saved, that people who never knew Christ are not going to be saved. That doesn't mean that people who grew up in another country and were born into another religion are not going to be saved. That's not what it means. What it means is that there's only one family of God that God himself initiated and wants everyone to come into. That's called the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, the household of faith, the one true one that has the fullness of the truth that all the other ones have little sprinklings of. It's the Catholic church that God is calling everyone into, the family of God. That's why there's no salvation outside of it. So in heaven, it's not going to be, you're not going to have any more Buddhists, really. You're not going to have any more Muslims. You're not going to have any more people who are following this, following that at all. God is calling us into his one family. The word Catholic means universal. The one universal family of God. And my prayer is that people accept it now, or at least on their deathbed, the strange mystery that happens between a soul and God that we may not know or understand, that God would draw souls into his family. And if the Catholic Catechism says that, and it does, it's there, how much more could we say there's no salvation outside of Mary? Is she the Savior? No. Does she save us? No. Is she divine? No. Do we worship her like we worship the Trinity? Absolutely not. But without her, we wouldn't have Jesus. Without her, we wouldn't have the church. Without her, we wouldn't have the sacraments. We would not be here today celebrating Mass. You would not be receiving the body and blood, soul and divinity of Jesus Christ. You would not be being absolved from your sins because she is the mother of priests. Priests are born through her heart. You would not have anything. Had God not put and placed upon that woman, that lowly handmaid of the Lord, everything. That's why at the Annunciation, when the angel comes and says to her, do you take God to be your spouse? It's basically what the angel was proposing to her. And she says, yes. All of creation was waiting for her answer. That's what the saints say. Waiting. What is she going to say? And she says a bridal response. I do. Take me. Make me fruitful. And does he? You bet makes her the new Eve, mother of all the living, and the mother of God. The mother of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Wow. What a woman. What a lady. What a queen. This is our mother. I'm going to talk a lot more about that in my talk at 11. 
But for those of you who just came for the Mass today, I understand there are some people that are not able to stay for the whole day. You may not be able to hear the talk later. I want to show you or explain to you in a scientific way. Because a lot of times people think science and faith, they're contrary. You know, you say that Our Lady is so exalted by your faith, but, you know, prove it. Okay. Science even now has proven this. The exalted dignity of Our Lady. I'm amazed at how much the scientific community doesn't want this to get out. Because a lot of them tend to be atheists and, you know, don't, don't believe in God, or if they do, he's way out there and he's not interested in us. And they're looking and spending all their money looking for little green men in the cosmos with their dishes, you know, trying to hear. Is anybody speaking? What has science told us lately about the Blessed Virgin Mary? Check this out. I have, maybe some of you have heard of this. I don't know. It's brand new. It's only been around, discovered about seven years ago. These scientists, really smart people in like biomolecular whatnot, I don't even know the terminology of these people and in the, in the doctorates they have and all of these skilled things. But these scientists discovered something, a thing called fetal microchimerism. Have any of you heard of this? Amazing. Okay. What they discovered is that when a woman, any woman, all of you who, who are here who have been pregnant, this applies to you as well. You're going to be blown away by this. Any woman who becomes pregnant, okay, even if that woman suffers a miscarriage, even if that woman tragically makes the wrong choice and gets rid of the life within her through an abortion, or if the baby comes to full term and is, sees the light of day, Cells are exchanged between the mother and the child, living cells, so that after either a miscarriage, tragically, sadly, an abortion, or birth, those cells will remain in your body, ladies, for the rest of your life. You have, and if you didn't know it, you're probably going to start crying. You have living cells of all your children in your body right now right now, even if you had a miscarriage, right now. That's not it. It doesn't end there. That's amazing. But it also happens the other way, that us, all of us, who come from a mother, we have the cells, living cells, of our mothers in us, in our bodies. You ever, the scientists were kind of joking around with it and they said, maybe this will help explain how we always say that mother has some intuition about her children. She always knows when something's not right. You can try and fake it, and I did. You know, I'd come home, whatever, and she would know. I could try and put on my smiley face, put, you know, uh, red eye or whatever that stuff is in my eyes, try to get the, you know, red eye out and try and look presentable. But she would know, Donnie, what's wrong? I'm like, how does she do that? The scientist said, it's not that your mother is looking over your shoulder, she's in your shoulder. <laughs> Somehow there's such an intimate bond between a mother and her children that there's this living exchange of cells that happens for the rest of life. And in the life of the mother, scientists discovered that when a woman becomes sick, who has been a mother, they noticed certain clusters of cells from her body going to the ill area in her body. Whatever it was, whatever area, there would be a cluster of cells that would go to this area and would be seeking to make her well, to fight off the, whether it was a disease, whether it was a sickness, whatever it was, and guess what cells those were? The cells of your children. See, maternity has its blessings, big time. That's why even at the beginning when Adam and Eve fell, when God says, it, you know, you will be saved through childbearing, the word saved literally means health. Ultimate salvation is eternal life with God, ultimate health. When those cells run to the defense of the mother, even if the child no longer is here on earth through a miscarriage or through an abortion, your child is fighting to save your life in your body. That's amazing. 
Now let's apply this to Jesus and Mary. Okay, we've got the handmaid of the Lord, who the Holy Spirit fructifies and makes fertile, and the second person of the Blessed Trinity enters into her body and is there for nine months, and then comes through her body, born into the world. But does that mean that he's still not there? Nope. Science now would be able to even tell us that even after the birth of Jesus Christ through the womb of Our Lady, He, God Almighty, the God-Man, God, omnipotent, omniscient, almighty, I am, lived continually in her body through the cells that were exchanged. She's a living, walking tabernacle. This is why when she comes on the scene, she's not alone. This is why people say, you know, I've heard people, theologians say, Oh, you know, we don't like those paintings that, that show Mary crushing the head. Technically, it's Jesus. He's the sole redeemer. Okay, wise guy. <laughs> but see, science even tells us now that even after he was born, he's still there. She's not the redeemer. You're right. She's not the savior. You're right. However, he's still alive, even in her body. And when she comes on the scene, it is actually her... And Jesus threw her, crushing the head of the serpent. That's why we call her the terror of demons, the conqueror of all heresies. Satan hates her. The bookends of history are about what? From Genesis to Revelation. Satan, Lucifer, the devil, the dragon, attacking the woman. Right? So clear. Genesis chapter 3, Revelation chapter 12. The bookends of human history. Satan hates her because she is that creature so exalted, so humble, living tabernacle of God, mother of Jesus Christ, that brings the light into the world. And without her, we're in the dark. Let's take it a step further. Remember how those cells will fight for the life of the mother? Well, because we're born in sin, the fruit of that we die. Ultimately, we're, we are going to die. All of us. Did you know that the church has never technically defined how Mary made that transition to heaven? Right, did you know that? We'd never technically say it's not a dogmatic formulation that Mary experienced death like you and I do. See, we celebrate her assumption, August 15th. We don't celebrate her resurrection. Why? Because she didn't die like you and I die. She experienced a transition. The early church called it the transitus Mariae, some form of transition. Or the Eastern church called it the dormition, the falling asleep of the Blessed Virgin Mary, making that transition into heaven to be with her son, to be queen of heaven and earth. But she wasn't a sinner like you and me. She's not going to die like you and me. She's not going to experience decay in a tomb like you and me. And even science can affirm it now. Because if she had the cells of God Almighty in her body, how could she possibly experience death? She's got divine cells in her. God himself would never allow his dear mother to become corrupted and to, become, to decay and to have worms and whatnot consume her body. Mm -mm. She is holy, set aside, pattern of the church. This is why also, see, the church can never die. One, because Jesus said so. But two, because the church is patterned off of the immaculate one. She can never be overcome. She can never be conquered. The devil can never take her. She's the pattern. This is amazing stuff. God loves you so much that he shares this mother with you to be your mother. Take refuge in her. Take refuge in her in your particular situations. Entrust and consecrate your children to her. As parents, you've got those parental rights. Give your children to the Blessed Virgin Mary. You're not going to be able to do it. Just Mary, I give them to you. I give you. I am their parents by, by flesh. But spiritually, you are our mother in the order of grace. 
please, please, take them. Take my husband, take my children, take, take, I give to you. She has been given so much and entrusted with so much and she can work wonders. She can change hearts, families, dioceses. She can change seminaries. She can change convents. She can change somebody like me. A long-haired, crack-smoking, hippie, free-loving weirdo. To be saying the things that I'm saying to you today. What? This is who she is. This is what she can do. She can take a Satanist and change him. She did. She can take men who were so bad in ways that I wasn't, change them and make them a priest and make them a saint. She can take you and change your life and your family's life. Pray about these things. All the graces that you're given this weekend, recommit yourself to loving Jesus through Mary. It is the will of God that you honor her. It is the will of God that you give your life to her because it was the will of God that he come to you through her. He could have chosen to do it a million ways. He's God. He could have, like I said yesterday, poof, shazam, Jesus just pops out of the air at age 33. He could have done that. God can do this. God can do this. But he didn't. He chose to humble himself and be born of a virgin. And the God who learned how, the God who made languages and gave you your legs, that God learned how to walk. It seems crazy. God learned how to walk. God learned how to talk. What? Yeah. The paradox of the faith. Humility, extreme humility. Because God loves you that much. And he placed the crux of this mystery of Christianity upon a woman, upon her response to an angel. Fiat, be it done unto me. What Jesus wants to hear from you has already been said. Just say it. Be it done unto me too. Me too. Because you're never going to outdo her. She's the pattern, the blueprint of what Jesus wants you to be. And for those of you who are mothers, you're going to go home today with a whole different understanding of your relationship with your children, whether they're here or they've died. You've got living cells of your children in your body. You're so blessed to be a mother. Maternity is such a gift, such an exalted gift. Treasure it. God has entrusted you with a great, great gift. Seek to have Our Lady in your life so that you can live to be the mothers that God desires you to be. Because He's so that in love with you. That even now, science affirms our dogma. Science catches up with, in time, what we've been professing for centuries. There's no contradiction. We believe by faith what science itself, in time, will affirm. Thank you, Jesus and Mary. Amen.